So thanks, thanks a lot for our operational excellence webinar. Um, this is our our eighth uh, webinar, <clears throat> and we've been uh, doing this or organizing these webinars to help um, our CJR and ours and uh, whoever would be interested in learning the operational excellence continuous improvement tools um as i said this is our eighth uh web webinar um we part of this um this strategy on on why we need to have these webinars is becoming even more uh, relevant today with this what we we will um implement under the one CGIR. Uh, most of you uh, may know the breeding resource initiative, one of the the, um, the, the CGIR initiative. Uh, one of the goal of that initiative is to establish uh, the quality management system, establishing the networks for, for uh, managing uh, processes. Um, and many of these things that we've been discussing on on these webinars will become more um, uh, will become a, a daily part of our um, activity. So you will see more and more about these things um, every day, more and more and more. Um, so. Today, uh, just let's to, and go to some slides here just to, to help um, to introduce what we'll do today. Um, first, we, as I said, we've been presenting many tools. We learned five S, eight ways, five whys, why we need to have continuous improvement team, root cause analysis, interrelationship diagraph, value stream map. So we learned many. The, in, in learning not only the tools but also examples of these tools being applied in, in our um, in a breeding organization uh, from our last webinar we just a remind we learned uh, so key behaviors in the continuous improvement culture we learned uh, Kehinde from IITA presented the introduction on processing map uh, and also we counted with uh, some uh, special uh, guests to, to or they presented the adoption of lean uh, in some uh, farms in Nigeria. Um, another important aspect I'd like to remind you too is all of these webinars, they are available in our channel in YouTube. You can always go there and, and, and review, revisit that and learn. Um, we have also um, continuous improvement uh, e-learning training that you can always go there and, and, and access, and it's a self-paced training you can go and learn too. Uh, and of course, also some materials available in the IB toolbox. Um, so with that uh, said, I'd like to invite our first uh, presenter. Uh, is our consultant helping us with um, deployment of this culture in, in CG and, and national park programs. Um, Theresa, may I ask you to share your screen if you were ready? Hello, this is Teresa. Thanks for joining us today. And I'm happy to see so many participants um, getting online and, and anxious to learn about standard operating procedures. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to talk about one of the concepts of, of continuous improvement. And I'm sure that you have probably all seen it before. Let me get my screen on presentation here. 
And that is to talk about the scientific method. And if you haven't heard of it before, you, you might be saying, well, why um, are we talking about scientific method when we're talking about continuous improvement? But we'll find that the scientific method actually applies, can be applied to all types of work. So when we, this is, this is one of our concepts that we think about when we're continuously improving. Um, if you think of it as a cycle, um, then you may have seen this um, in the past called and, and seen it as PDSA. You may see it as PDCA. And um, it's just a difference on how people are, are using words. So plan, do, study, act, or plan, do, check, act means the same thing. But I just want to um, we just walk through this really quickly and, and review what we would do in each one of these quadrants of this cycle. And this is an iterative cycle. So once we finish one cycle, then we start the next. So we can continuously are Im improving our standard, our standard process. So first thing we do is plan. And this step actually probably takes the longest of, of any of the steps, um, probably at least half of the total time, it seems like. But we want to understand what our, our current status is. Um, and we want to identify where we have improvement areas, establish our, measure, our performance measures and goals, do some root cause analysis, find out what is causing us not to be able to perform to the standards that we've set. And in this stage, we're also identifying some possible solutions and selecting solutions. So there's a lot, there's a lot in that quadrant. Next, we're gonna do, and that's just exactly what it says, right? We're going to take that solution that, we've, um, want, that we wanna try out. We need to train people on what that new solution is going to look like, and then let's, let's implement it. And you may wanna do that on a small scale um, to test, to make sure that, um, is going to work before you roll it all the way out to everyone. After we've implemented solutions, now let's study what's happening. Are we getting the results that we expected? If not, let's do some root cause analysis on those, those things that are, are very, where our variation is and understand what's going on and make some corrections. In the ACT quadrant, we want to resolve any immediate issues. We want to document and standardize all of our gains. So we, we have a new standard process in that ACT quadrant. We want everybody to have training and reflect on lessons learned. What did we learn from this iteration of improvement? And then as you can see there, go back to step one. So once we've, we've completed the cycle, we continue with a new cycle. And, and you probably you know many people were introduced to this plan, do, study, act. I think if back in uh, either in elementary school or in junior high, talking when we were in science class and talking about planning, experimenting, studying our experiment, and then um, implementing the changes that we need to make. So Pretty simple, but a concept that you'll see frequently then that we talk about often. And just to show you, you know, how we can continue to improve that overall process quality to meet our customers' needs, um, iteration after iteration and setting a new standard each time we make improvements. So that's all I had this morning on that concept. And I will hand it off to, to Gift and um, Gustavo, would you like to introduce GIF to the group? Yeah, yeah thanks, uh, Theresa. So um, GIF, um, I hope that you are ready to, to, to start, but uh, GIF is a farm manager uh, for IITA since 2019. He has also experienced working with the Ministry of Agriculture as an extension officer and as crop officer for a combined seven years. 
He holds a certificate in general agriculture and a diploma in general agriculture from Zambia College of Zambia and bachelor's degree in plant science from the University of Zambia. Uh, Gift uh, took the continuous improvement practitioner workshop through EIB about a year ago. So, uh, Gift, uh, the floor's yours. Are you ready? We can see your screen, but you are on mute, I believe. And we can't hear you. Yeah, that's me with the screen, Gustavo. Uh, Gift, are you here? Uh, make sure your microphone is unmuted. All right. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to my presentation. I'll be presenting on um, standard uh, work resources. I think my introduction was already done, so I'll just go straight to the presentation. So, yeah. Uh, as we have been learning from um, from uh, continuous improvement, we know that uh, standard work is um, part of the lean operations, and it's been used for by many companies uh, when it comes to this uh, fundamental lean methodology. Uh, by definition, I borrowed this one from. Um, uh, the to from Toyota, which is defined as um, a detailed uh, definition of the current best practices for performing a process. So from this uh, definition, I think what comes out key is uh, the weighed current, which means that the standard is not fixed. It should always be improved upon in, in this sense, standards uh, are only part of the methodology and uh, they'll serve as a baseline, which must be able to change in order to drive improvement. And uh, without standards, there can be no improvement. This was uh, said by Taich Ono from the Toyota Production System. I can go to the next slide. Yeah, this was just my diagrammatic representation of standard work, where we have the current process, and at the end we have standard work. In between, we have uh, immediately after the current process, we are observing and recording all the current steps in the process. And then we map the design, which we are going to follow, and then uh, identify the waste along the way or along the chain. Then we also establish how the material is going to flow and how it's going to be used. Then uh, once we were um, observing and recording, we implement the improved process changes and document the improved methods that will give us the standard work which we are looking for. So perhaps we can go to the next slide where I can explain in detail. Yeah, so the benefits of standard work is uh, it will actually help us to establish the best practices because we are trying to come up with a standard which is not fixed, it can be improved upon, but we are going to be using the best practices and also we'll reduce in defects, which are imperfections. Before we actually produce the product, we'll be able to see the defects early and correct them then we'll also be able to streamline problem solving, which means that uh, we'll make more efficient uh, and effective uh, ways by employing a faster and simpler method of solving the problem. And then also there's a reduction in variability, which means um, if we reduce variability, we are going to be consistent with what we are producing and the process we are following in order to come up with our product. So when you do the benefits of standard work is actually that it will reduce uh, in, uh, inconsistencies. Then there's also reduction in waste because we have the standard and uh, at any point where we divert from the standard, 
we are going to see that we are going in the wrong way. So we avoid waste by sticking to the standard. Also standard work will serve as a, a basis for continuous improvement. Yep. Then uh, here, these are some of the standard operations in uh, standard work. First of all, we determine the tact time, which is simply the product assembly duration that is needed to match the demand, the rate at which you are going to produce your product to meet the demand. And then uh, from when you, once you determine the tact time, you will determine your cycle time, which is simply the average time it's going to take to finish one unit of uh, a product. Then you determine the sequence, uh, simply the order in which you are going to carry out or complete your tasks. Then from uh, determining your work sequence, you determine the standard quantity, uh, the amount of materials that uh, should be required to complete a unit of a product, the normal waste, spoilage, all those, you determine them. And then uh, you prepare a standard um, workflow, uh, which is simply how uh, a piece of work will pass through the different uh, phases from uh, initiation to completion. And then I will prepare a standard operation sheet, which will be a document that uh, outlines how you carry out your operations. Then you continuously improve your, your standard so that uh, you come up with uh, the best way to carry out an operation we continue to improve on the standard operations. We can go, that is one of the standard operations, yeah. Then uh, standard work drives a uh, continuous uh, improvement. So by this, what we mean is that uh, this actually is a part of a uh, Kaizen, which I think is uh, an ancient philosophy that was adopted by Jap Japanese manufacturers to develop a culture of driving continuous uh, improvement. Uh, literally, Kaizen, when translated, uh, it means a small change. It states that uh, problems can be solved by making incremental improvements, that is, over a period of time. Small, small changes, when put together, will help us uh, solve bigger problems. Of course, it takes time. And then a standard work serves as a framework to facilitate and record these small changes in a formal way. The benefit here is that uh, it allows for the distribution of knowledge and uh, the progress that you are making across the workforce, whereby it helps uh, everyone to have a mindset of uh, continuous improvement. When you have a workforce that has a uh, a mindset that always wants them to improve. It also helps uh, for standards or the protocols to improve because the workforce is always uh, thinking of uh, what small step could they take to improve the process or the product. Everyone is able to look for small incremental ways to make the improvement so that together you can move forward and formalize the process. That is what I meant by uh, standard work drives continuous improvement. Maybe we can go to the next slide. Yeah, this one here is an example of a check sheet that we have at the farm. This is for the tractor that we have. On my right, there's a tractor. Then on my left, there's a check sheet. It's a, uh, a tractor breakdown maintenance check sheet. Uh, on the far left column, there are the defect types and then the tractor numbers. And then now uh, we note down the defects that are there. For example, number one, there's a brake pad, brake pads worn out, tractor one. Then uh, another one, the same defect, tractor three. Then in the far right column, you're just uh, indicating the total number of defects that are there. It was just an example of a check sheet that uh, we, we use at the farm. Yeah. 
Then further down to the next uh, slide. I think I only have about 15 minutes to present this. This is also part of uh, an example of the standard work that we do at the farm. This was a uh, winter plowing of our fields. The field on the far left, on the left side, we had um, soybean. And now during winter, we plowed it in readiness for planting of wheat so that we enhance crop rotation. Then on the right side, there was maize here. We planted it in winter. We would like to plant some legumes now so that when the season commences, we are going to use the same field. Our cycle is, uh, our rotation cycles are usually short because of um, the limited land, yeah. Then there's another slide, yeah. This one again here, this is the field that we, was being plowed. Uh, in, on, my, on my left here, this is our irrigation system. So when we are irrigating our trials, because some, you do not want to irrigate your trials halfway and you leave the other part dry. So what we do is we make sure we have enough water in the reservoir, we have power, enough to last us the whole period that, that we'll be irrigating our trials. So we make sure that uh, we have power, we have enough water to last. You don't want to uh, give some trials water and leave the other portions dry. You are going to create variability in the trials, which is what we are trying to run away from. Yes, I think these are but some of the examples that I can show of uh, standard work that we are doing here at IIT Zambia from the farm management section. This is just a video of uh, the disking that was being done. I'm not sure that it's going to play, but it's a short one and it's only about 30 seconds or 13 seconds. This field was first of all irrigated. Then we tried to disk it two or three times just to come up with a uniform seed bed. This is what I had for today. Thank you. It's, uh, if, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I think that we have maybe to move to the next presentation and uh, keep the questions uh, to the end. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Gift. Um, for the next one, I would like to invite Lily Molina. Um, one of the, the centers that has done a really good job on, on managing the, the protocols work is definitely Erie. Uh, Lily is works at Erie um, and manages part of this uh, quality uh, management uh, system, and not really quality management system, but it's directly involved on on on, on that for for Erie. Um, so Lily, may I ask you to to jump in, and uh, if you can, uh, you please introduce yourself and um, and go to your slides, please. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Gustavo. Good evening, everyone. Good evening from the Philippines. So I am Lily Molina, and I am the leader of the Erie Service Laboratories, and I was tasked to also lead the QMS project of our platform, Integrative Research Support Platform under the leadership of Sharifa. So we had our QMS and um, I think uh, that will be a topic on our other uh, workshop that will be done here at the HQ. So for today, we will have a conversation type of uh, presentation and I will be um, inviting Theresa as well to help me in this presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Lily. Yes, uh, today we're going to have uh, a kind of a conversational um, interview 
of Lily to uh, hear about all the uh, all of the things she knows about uh, SOPs and writing them. So, um, we Lily, we we ask you to talk about SOPs today because you have lots of experience writing and managing SOPs there for Erie, as you just mentioned. And um, it sounds like you're also helping some other platforms with their um, writing SOPs and establishing a quality management system. So we'd like to ask you some questions about all of this whole process and, and see um, what we can learn today. So first, um, can you just simply tell us what an SOP actually is? Some of us may thank not you, be familiar with it. Okay, thank you, Theresa. When we say SOP, it stands for Standard Operating Procedure. And it is a set of written instructions that document a routine or repetitive activity followed by an organization. This definition came from US EPA 2007. And uh, what we have when we talk about SOP, it must follow a certain pattern or a certain template. And it has to be uniformly written throughout the organization that follows this standard operating procedure. So that's the brief uh, definition of an SOP. Thank you, Lily. So um, I'm wondering if you, can you briefly explain why it is important to have your SOPs and to have that process documented? And wonder, what are some of the benefits of actually um, having an SOP? Okay, so maybe we can refer to my next slide, which is slide three. And in here, we could, uh, uh, without an SOP, for example, the one that you can see is just an instruction on your left side. And without a standard operating procedure, and you are the one assigned to do those tasks, would probably lead to a lot of inconsistencies when it comes to quality. And so there is more chance of human error and there will be an increased cost for staff training if we have only this kind of protocol to follow. So it would also entail wasted time and money and probably they will uh, commit some errors in doing the, uh, the task assigned to them and it will lead to a low employee morale. Whereas in the next slide, if we have an SOP, then quality service is guaranteed. We can have an improved process understanding among the staff that will be doing the task that will be assigned to them. And this will also serve as our training tool for our new employees. So definitely the benefit would be time and cost saving because our staff will be doing the right things with clear and concise set of instructions for all of their internal processes. And definitely this will lead to customer satisfaction and improved team morale. So for our service laboratory or a service unit, having SOP will ensure the consistency, quality and integrity of the service or laboratory data that we produced. Okay, great. Um, it looks, sounds like there's a lots of, of benefits to having our standard operating procedures actually documented and, and everyone following the same way. But, but really, that, that looks very complicated. And, you know, sometimes when I'm writing an SOP, I'm not sure if I'm doing it correctly. So I wondered if there's a, is there a right way to go about documenting a process or, you know, what are the steps that are needed um, in writing an SOP and, and why? Okay, so there are many ways to writing an SOP, and but there is no one standard way of writing an SOP. There are several ways of writing it. But one thing to keep in mind is that your SOP should always be easy to follow and specific to your organization. SOP format should do the same. It should be specific to your organization. For us at Erie, we follow the ISO format or templates and they are available. So depending on the vision and goal of your organization. So at Erie, we adopted the ISO 9001 format in standardizing our internal processes. So I will go through the different steps later on, probably, as we discuss further about the S these SOPs. 
Okay, thank you, Lily. Thank you. Um, so, you know, sometimes we think that SOPs, is, it's kind of a daunting job to do, but it sounds like there's a lot of information out there that can help us get, get through the writing, the process a little less, with a little less pain. Um, and this is another thing that I've come across in the years when, when we've been implementing um, quality and quality management systems and continuous improvement is a question about, do we need SOPs for all jobs? And are there some jobs that actually wouldn't need them? And what is your experience with um, SOPs in administrative processes? And also with leaders and managers, um, are, are there SOPs uh, that, that they need to have also? My answer is yes. All jobs need an SOP to follow to fulfill the task required in a process flow. For example, admin processes such as sample receiving procedure, review of requests, standards, or contracts, while supervisory and managerial tasks like handling customer complaints and non-conforming works, risk management, staff training, and competence require SOP to have consistent and quality results. So we need SOPs, but these are for more repetitive type of task to get consistent and quality results. Okay. Well, it seems complex in getting all of this um, put together. Can, can you talk about how maybe to simplify the process? And is there a way to make it actually fun? Well, yes, I would say. SOP writing is analogous to a mother anticipating a child delivery. She plans and makes all the necessary preparations, experience labor and birth pains. Then the glorious moment comes when she sees her newborn baby. Similarly, in SOP writing, there is also the planning and preparation stage. The SOP drafting and writing is the labor and birth pain stage. But once you have a well-written SOP delivered, then that is when you get the full benefits of SOP. So to make it an enjoyable experience, I would suggest invite the team with the stakeholders to a coffee session on a Friday afternoon. You start with a process flowchart for an existing process if available and review the flowchart. So for my slide, slide six, Identify what is critical to the customer and how the process can be revised to include the steps that will address any customer complaints, risk or failure points in the current process flow and incorporate control points or QC checks in the process flow. So starting with a flow chart, incorporate the CTC, critical to customer, Revise the flow chart by incorporating our QC points or our QC check. And then of course, we want to draft our SOP following a standard template that is fit for your organization. And once we put all our brains together over a coffee <coughs> session during Friday afternoon, then we can have a draft of our SOP and continuous fine tuning of it will end up to have a well-written, well-written SOP. Now that, that does sound like more fun than what I've experienced. So, mm -hmm. and I like that, you know, you have a specific time um, when you're, you've set aside to work on SOPs. And actually I would, I would think about that as, you know, part of the, the management or the leader standard work would be to have this session to review the SOPs and and uh, and review the critical to customer needs and complaints and all to see what you need to do to further meet meet them. But it's not only the responsibility of the leaders, Theresa. It should be the process owners, the ones that are directly involved in doing the processes. And then we can also incorporate inputs from our customers and other interested parties. Mm -hmm. So it will be a fun coffee session with everybody. Yeah, that sounds great. That sounds great. Um, you mentioned about um, 
SOP templates. Are there essential parts or sections of an SOP and why are they important? So I, so in, okay, so in my slide seven, it shows the six main sections of an admin SOP, while slide eight, the next slide, has 14 main sections, and this is intended for technical SOP. Back to slide seven, please. So of course we have the header. The header is header and the footer are always there in a standard template. The header containing the title, a document number, who is the owner of that SOP. So it should be organization and specific department or unit, a revision number and a date of SOP approval. The main sections for uh, an admin or management or laboratory or SOP include the following. We have the title page, the revision review record section. Then we have the table of contents. Then we have the scope or purpose and application, the definition, responsibilities, procedure, reference, and attachment. So what are the contents of all this? Let's go into the main sections, which is the scope or purpose and application. This part answers the why an SOP has to be written and what is its intended use, the procedure that we are writing. And in the scope, this entails the area covered as well as the exclusions. In the definition section, these are the terms that need to be defined to understand the process. Under the responsibility section, who are the people who will implement the procedure to achieve the purpose? And the bulk of it goes into the procedure wherein it lists the step-by-step -step details of what needs to be done. We need to keep it logical in logical sequence. And this section is as long as it's needed to accurately describe the process. We can also, if it's a very lengthy procedure, we can refer to some work instructions in the procedure section or some forms or some policies that are relevant to the procedure that are the, to the procedure or step-by-step -step details that you want to include in here. Next one is the reference section. It lists the reference documents that relate to this procedure. And then we have the attachment or appendix or addendum that includes related documents to that procedure. So those are the main sections that I'd like to discuss, but on the technical, technical SOP, we need to include a lot more like materials, uh, the calculations, the quality control sections, and a lot more as I have shown you in slide number eight. Okay, that's great. And that, that helps, <clears throat> helps me a lot, especially with some of the SOPs that we need to write that, that may not be technical at kind of, only seeing a, a few steps there um, just kind of helps me wrap my mind around it that it was not such a daunting task. So, we, you know, we, we need to write a lot of SOPs and um, we, we maybe haven't ever at attempted to do that on some processes. Would there be um, a process that you would use for just helping get ourselves started? Okay, so we're now coming into our slide number nine. And according to the US EPA document, Guidance for Preparing Standard Operating Procedure, this talks in more details the step-by-step -step procedure on how to document a, a, a protocol, a work instructions, a policy, and everything. So according to this document, the development and use of SOP are an integral part of a successful quality system. And it provides individual with the information to perform a job properly. And it facilitates consistency in the quality and integrity of a product or end result. Thus, the proper preparation of SOP is key to laying the foundation for achieving consistent process. By following a few general steps, we can prepare SOP for use within your organization. So let us go into this. 
first one is the tip. So before preparing your own SOP, here's the tip. Look at as many SOP examples as you can prior to preparing yours. And then here are the steps that we would like you to know to kick off your SOP writing. Step one, identify what procedures or processes in your organization need SOP in order to be carried out in a consistent manner. And who are the persons that are most qualified to author the SOP? A team approach may, may also be used to both identify the need for the SOP and write the SOP. The second step is once you have identified the procedures and processes that you need to write an SOP, you need to determine a numbering system to ensure adequate document control of your SOP. So you need to list down all the documents that you want to come up with an SOP and come up with a master list so that no duplicate number in your document control will be used. So once you have the master list, you have uh, assigned a unique numbering system, then the step number three is to develop an SOP template that all organizational SOPs will follow. So once you decide on the template to use, with sections, for example, the one that I have shown you for administrative SOP and the sections for technical SOP, make sure that your SOP template is final before issuing it. Any changes mean you must revise every SOP written using that template. So develop an SOP template that you will use after the master list has been done. And then once you have the template chosen, Write an SOP on how to write your standard operating procedures for your organization. This is known as the SOP on SOPs. Use the developed template and set forth your expectation as to how all SOP should be prepared. For example, who identifies the need, who assigns the number, what format to use, and expectations for what should be included in each section. And last one, step five, is for you to prepare the rest of your SOPs based on this SOP on SOPs and making any minor revisions to improve the preparation process in terms of time, quality, and quality of the re resulting document. So a process can be written step by step. It may be rendered as a flow chart. And a flow chart could be consist of graphical symbols similar to what I have mentioned earlier. So you can start with your flow chart and then fill the template that you have chosen, write every section that is required in that one, and then you'll have your draft SOP written and fine tuning it will allow you to follow the SOP and SOPs that you have established and then the succeeding other SOPs can be done in accordance to that SOP. So I hope I made myself clear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Lots of information there. And it sounds like there's a lot of um, resources that can help us um, when, we're, when we're attempting to get these processes written. Um, so once, once uh, we write our SOP, we're all done, right? Or is, is there some type of a review process that has that we have to go through? Um, to, and, and then also who, who does that? Um, if we have a review process, who's responsible for that? Yeah, okay. SOPs are not cast in stones. They are subject to revision. With time, your business adapts and refines its procedure and processes to work better and to adapt to changing circumstances. Also, SOP may contain error and glitches, so it is a good practice to review SOP annually and update them as needed. So who are the persons most qualified to review them? The process owners. The process owners are the ones that know any revision in the existing SOPs. And then once the process owners review that, 
it has to be passed on to the supervisor who will review it on a second layer and approve if all the revisions are acceptable and then it will be approved and officialized as the revised SOP. So the person most qualified to author the SOP could be the supervisors with inputs from the artists, customers, stakeholders, and other interested parties. A team approach may also be used to review and to write an SOP. So they need to do it all together and uh, with all of their insights put into an SOP, they can keep them simple and meaningful and what they are so important when it comes to meeting the needs of customers and having the base for continuous improvement. All right. Thank you, Lily. Thank you for um, sharing all that great information with us. And we'll have this, um, this, this webinar being recorded. So um, you shall live in infamy, as they say. But we, if you want to go back and review this later, um, that the information is, is there for you. So we have a few minutes left for questions, for questions of either myself, Gift, or, or Li Lily, or, or Gustavo. So any questions that you might have, we'd be happy to, to uh, try to answer. Lisa, we have one question in the chat from Amir. Um, I think you partially answer, answer that question, Lily, but maybe we can uh, elaborate a bit more. And how often do you review and, uh, and update the SOPs? Is there an audit or internal review that is done to make sure all procedures are up to date and followed? Uh, okay, so what we have done so far at it is that before officializing an SOP, the process owner writes the draft and then it undergoes a team review. So the supervisor is there plus other interested parties and even the, the customers could be there. So once you have a well-written SOP, then an annual review can be done. Or whenever there are changes done in the procedure, let's say a customer requires another control point to avoid or mitigate a risk that he or she has identified during this, the discussion, then a revision in the SOP has to be done. So uh, an audit or internal review, yes, we have done that as well at ERI. So an internal audit was done for us to assess the compliance of our service units to the ISO 9001 standards. And with that, we were also able to identify some of the procedures or protocols that are not yet properly written based on the template that we have agreed to use. And so the service unit has to rewrite their SOPs in accordance to the agreed template that is suitable for ERI. So those are some of the examples that I could cite related to that one. Given that you are affiliated to a particular ISO, do you then get external auditors to come and audit your quality management system? Yes, for us in the laboratory, because we are accredited to an ISO IEC 17025, it is the accreditation body that monitors our compliance. And so they come whenever we are scheduled to have our assessment. And so they visit us or during the pandemic, they do the uh, remote assessment for us. So these are external auditors, but we have also an internal audit in place within our team. So we do our regular internal audit according to the schedule that we have agreed upon within our team. Is there any other question which I missed? I just sent one, Lily. Okay. I have, I'm saying that, do you have to have a certification if you have a QMS? I would say it helps a lot if we have the certification because that proves to the world that we have satisfied all the requirements of the standard. And so the zeal of our certification marks the, uh, it's like our trophy 
that we have accomplished all of the requirements and the assessment body found us to be uh, compliant to all of the requirements of the standard. However, for ERI, we don't have certification, but we are aiming for uh, compliance to the ISOs, ISO 9001. But I mm -hmm. think in order for us to fine tune the so-called compliance, we need to have a metrics how much compliance are we talking about so that we can assess if we are reaching our target of compliance. So I was suggesting that probably we have to define how much compliance, would it be 75%, 85%, and then keep it higher and higher until we are ready for certification. I think the certification will not cost that much because the, the higher cost of certification comes when we involve a consultant. But for ERI, we don't have any consultant. We do it by ourselves. And <laughs> so it's just the, them coming to assess our uh, compliance to the standards. And then if they find us compliant, then the seal of certification will be given to us as a proof. So it's my it's, take on that one. It's good that we have you um, as with so much experience that we, we know we have so, so much internal experience um, when people come to that. But a, a lot of us, we, just, we need to just start documenting, you know, deciding what SOPs we need to have and start to document that work. And that can serve as a basis for us for, for continuing to improve. So Writing the SOP yeah. is the start. Yeah. Yes, yes, and the rest of it, it, it it'll all build on itself <clears throat> as we go. So take eat, eating an elephant, as they say, one bite at a time. Yes. Any other questions from the um, from the participants here today? I'd be curious um, if you can just uh, maybe raise your hand. Have, who all has been involved in, in writing a standard operating procedure? If you can raise your hand or put it into the chat. I can see the hands of my colleagues at Erie. And also Peter and Amir, who else? It seems like we have a lot of participants doing their SOPs as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Sweet. So I hope they learned something. And <laughs> oh, after, we got after, a lot. After the, uh, our webinar, I bet you everyone's going to go right back down, right to their desk and start writing their SOPs. So the guidance that was provided to you, the US EPA, uh, because of the constraint in time, I cannot go into the details, but I think it will help. Uh, to uh, have more detailed uh, explanation as to how they can kick off writing their SOPs. Excellent, yes. So thanks, Lady. And also the materials, even the webinar or this recording will, be, will, will make that available. People can always go there and watch. So PowerPoint presentation will make that available too. Yeah. So thanks a lot. So it, it does look like there's one. Uh, excuse me, a, um, a qu question out there. Um, so for Lily again, do you have? Do you then get external auditors to come and audit your quality management system? So have you had uh, external auditors? External auditors. Um, in a way, yes. I have a colleague from Canada that comes to the Philippines to present in a, a symposium in chemistry congress and usually he drops off to Erie and do some external audit for us that's for the laboratory but not for the ISO 9001 for the ISO 9001 QMS we do it among ourselves so I did the training on internal audit and so we're, we're going to have another round of internal audit this year. 
So it will be across the different service units after the training, then it's time for them to do the actual internal audit. But uh, so far for our QMS, we haven't um, we haven't availed of an external auditor. We just had at the start an internal auditor. Sorry, uh, a consultant, an external consultant who who taught us about internal audit, and that is the Canadian friend that I have. So to introduce the platform into this ISO nine thousand one internal. Audit. Um, can, sorry, go ahead. I need to ask a question here, if, if it's possible, because this is just a little confusing. Are you ISO certified? Okay, or do you possess an ISO certification for your labs, for example, or don't you? Because if you do, I believe that there should be an institute that comes and performs an audit in order to renew your uh, ISO certification every year. Uh, similar yes. goes to other organizations where you have even for research institutes, for uh, labs, or for universities, these things uh, occur and, and happen and you get the certification and you keep that for uh, either exchange or commercial purposes or to get to extend some services. So That's, do you possess yeah. that as a, as a certificate or, or not? Yes, we have, we are an accredited chemical testing laboratory for ISO IEC 17025. That is the standard that is suitable for a testing laboratory. So we are now running into our uh, 15th year. And uh, so far, the accreditation is good for five years. And every two years, the accreditation body comes to our laboratory to conduct a surveillance visit. And in this way, they assess our compliance throughout the requirements in the standard, as well as the Philippine Accreditation Bureau also has its supplementary requirements. And so we need to satisfy all those requirements for us to continue our accreditation. Now, I have another project, which is the quality management system project for ISO 9001 2015 version for our platform. So that is separate from our laboratory because we are already accredited. And this one is an ongoing process. And that is the one that I am referring to that for the quality management system of our platform, we do not avail of any external auditors. We just do it among ourselves and we have done the first round of internal audit and management review after the three service units were able to satisfy all the requirements of every section in the ISO 9001 standard. So I hope I made myself clear this time. <laughs> yes, thanks. Uh, I mean, uh, Gustavo, can I just come in a little, uh, one minute? I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, yes, just to explain. Thinking. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, just to explain. Um, for the for the integrative research platform, uh, because I assigned Lily to help to do that. Um, I think we are we are not aiming for accreditation. We are aiming for compliance first. That's why we are not going for external audit, but we do internal audit amongst ourselves. So. Um, we get proper training um, through this friend of Lily, um, train our team to be internal audit so we can do cross auditing as well. And I think in the beginning, that is, for me at least, uh, is sufficient because at least you get started and perhaps some years down the line, we will get accredit acc accredited. So I, I would recommend something like that um, in, in the case of everyone as well, because I think it really helps um, rather than jumping straight into um, a full accreditation exercise. Thanks. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So thanks. Uh, we are running out of time here now. So thanks a lot, Lily. Thanks, uh, Gift. Um, as uh, Gift uh, presented, 
there's no improvement if we don't have a, a, our standard procedure. No, I mean, we need to have something to improve. So uh, I really believe that starting mapping the process, defining the, the, the SOPs is a, a first uh, step for, for most of the, the work that we need to do in, in, in our breeding organization in CGIR and national programs, national partners. So thanks a lot. Uh, as I said, uh, thanks, uh, Teresa, too. Uh, this um, recording will be available. So looking forward for the next one that we'll organize soon. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. Have a really good uh, rest of the week. Thank you. Bye.